Hear now the word of God from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, there were people all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, a crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight this morning. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some of my favorite conversations begin with the words, Mom, I have a great idea. When either Natalie or Augie, who are six and five, say these words to me, I know that I am in for an enjoyable conversation. And I engaged in one such conversation full of imagination and wonder just a couple of days ago when Augie said to me, Mom, I have a great idea. And before I could even say what, he launched into this stream of consciousness telling of a plan that he had for our family, a plan in which we would save the world by becoming a team of superheroes. We all have special powers, he reasoned, even the cat. Daddy's power, he said, is strength. And you can calm people down, Mom, he said. He said, Natalie is very fast, and I am super smart. And even Olivia, she is toddlery. And that's a power in and of itself, I guess. I said, wait a minute, you think being calm is my superpower? And he said, well, yes, and you have the ability to calm other people down, too. And so together, we can save the world, and the cat Sprinkles can be our guard, because she can teleport. It's a great story, 
It's one full of power and possibility that continues to unfold on a daily basis in the felt household in such a manner that I cannot wait to hear what happens next. Well, our text for today from the book of Acts has similar features. It's a great story. And we find ourselves in the book of Acts chapter 2 because, again, today is the day of Pentecost in the life of the church, the day when we specifically celebrate the presence and the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And truthfully, over the past several weeks, we have been talking about the way the Spirit moves in our lives. We've been talking about the power of the Spirit to enable us to repent and to live differently, to empower us to share the good news, to participate in our own healing, to witness to Jesus in many ways with our very lives, truly to accept the work of God in our lives. And none of that is possible without the movement of the Holy Spirit. And first, we have to recognize that the Spirit is present with us in our midst and within our very selves. And that's the story of Pentecost. That's the story that we're highlighting this morning. It's a story that takes place 50 days after our Easter Sunday celebrations because it was this time of the year when the people of God would have celebrated the wheat harvest. The people who worship God of Israel and the Mediterranean world would have been gathering for what they called Pentecost at that time. And what we discover in Acts chapter 2 is that the power of God breaks through in a new way in this familiar festival that took place in the year that Jesus was resurrected. Now, at this point, Jesus has already ascended into heaven. We celebrated Ascension Sunday just last week. He's already promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is why he tells his disciples to stay in Jerusalem. Likely, they would have stayed in Jerusalem anyway for the celebration of the festival. Regardless, that's exactly where they are when a large number of people gather and a demonstration of God's presence and power literally sweeps through the place. I'll read those verses again. Suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rushing of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now these symbols of fire and wind, they would have been recognizable to the people. They were symbols of God's power, God's work in the lives of the people. And we read about them in the Old Testament. For example, God subsides the waters of the flood in the time of Noah with a gust of wind. God speaks to Moses from a burning bush, calling him to be an agent of the people's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. God leads the people in the wilderness after their escape from Egypt in a pillar of fire. And God speaks to the suffering of Job from a mighty whirlwind. And these are just a few examples. These are just a few examples that we find in our Old Testament. They show of God's faithfulness, and they would have risen to the minds of the people as they felt that mighty rushing wind, as they saw the tongues of fire amid all of the talking that was going on that day. Still, even with these familiar events of wind and fire, it must have been quite an experience, quite a sight. And it left these faithful followers of Jesus asking the question, what does it mean? What does it mean? This is a common question for us to ask as human beings. It's a natural one because regardless of how creative and free-spirited we are, we're analytical creatures when it comes down to it. We want to know what's going on in the world around us. We want to be able to explain what's happening to us and to the people that we love. And this line of questioning tends to take us down at least one of at least two paths. It could take us down a path of hope and curiosity that leads us to greater possibility and new life, or it can lead us down a path of inquisition and judgment that often leads to condemnation and death. 
Our search for meaning in our experiences can lead us to greater hope and possibility, or it can lead us to inquisition and condemnation. And the difference between the two is one of life and of death. So it's in that difference between amazement and dismay that we find the people in our story in the book of Acts. We find them in the crowd in Jerusalem as God showed up in the old places with a familiar feel, but in a new way, removing barriers of communication, allowing them to understand each other, even while they were speaking different languages. Our text for today uses words like bewildered and perplexed, alongside words like astonished and amazed. Indeed, some translations say utterly amazed. What does this mean? They ask. What does this mean? And those who have lost their prophetic imagination, they just assume that the people who are talking are drunk. But those who have been able to hold on to hope, they see God at work in the world. They see the power of God at work, and it's to that power that the Apostle Peter stands up and testifies in one of his famous speeches in the book of Acts as he rejects those accusations of drunkenness, saying it's only nine o'clock in the morning after all, and he points instead to the work of God, the power of God at work all along. And this particular speech is rooted in a passage from the Hebrew Bible. It's found in the book of Joel. It speaks of visions and dreams and the spirit working to bring about equity and equality, signs of God's power, signs like wind and fire, all pointing to the glory of God, all pointing to the salvation of the world. It's truly amazing. It's truly amazing, beloved, because that same power is available to us today. That same Holy Spirit still dwells among us and within us, enabling us to live with hope and with clarity and with open communication and with unity. But it's up to us to embrace that work of the Holy Spirit or to reject it. So what's it going to be? Which path are we going to choose? The story isn't over. We are the characters on the scene now, and we may not be the superheroes that Augie envisioned sent to save the world, but we are living in this world with the power of the Holy Spirit invited to participate in the life-saving work that God is already doing. It's a great story, and it's just as full of power and possibility as it was on that day of Pentecost in the year that Jesus was resurrected. And that may be a difficult statement for us to reconcile with everything that we're experiencing right now in the world, with the pandemic and the economic strain and the social unrest and the cultural strife as our anger tends to give way to fear and to hatred, and to violence. And you may be tired of hearing these words in church, especially because we can't seem to escape them anywhere else. But beloved, these are the church's problems too. This is the work of the church. This is the work that lies before us as a people of God in this moment in history. And it's a monumental task to be sure. Unity. Justice, freedom, equity, love. Not only do these words present themselves as ideals that remain utterly beyond our reach, they've also become symbols of sorts of the wars that we are waging against each other, even within the body of Christ. Increasing our divisions, driving us further and further to the extremes until it feels like we are speaking different languages. This is a job not for supermen and women, but for the Holy Spirit, literally. Thank God the Holy Spirit's already been released among us. 
our celebration of that mighty work of God, just as Jesus promised, is not relegated to one Sunday in the church calendar either. Truly, the best way that we can celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit is to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. The best way that we can celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit is to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, and the choice is ours. We can be dismayed by everything that's going on in our world to the point that we just shut down and we move to one corner or the other. Or we can remain utterly amazed at the power of God that is still at work, bringing people together in unlikely ways, making open communication possible, truly for the greater good, truly for the salvation and the healing of all of creation. So let me be clear here, our grief has a place in the movement of the Holy Spirit. It's entirely healthy and appropriate to acknowledge and to name what it is that we grieve. And if what you're feeling these days is more akin to anger, let me remind you that anger is a part of grief as well. And the good news is that by the power of the Holy Spirit, our grief becomes not a state of being, but a process. It becomes a process through which God is at work, a process that leaves room for hope to grow. And hope, remember, is not wishful thinking. Hope is a power in its own right. It's the power that we need to keep listening when someone says something that we don't want to hear. It's the power to keep moving with compassion toward the suffering when we think we have seen more than we can bear. It's the power to keep loving people who seem downright unlovable in this moment. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is our superpower, beloved. At the very least, it holds the utter dismay at bay long enough for us to see that God is at work, to see that the God of wind and fire is still loose in this world and that we have as much access to that power today as the people did on that Pentecost day so long ago. The power that we have in this moment to hope in light of everything that we're facing, that is utterly amazing. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit with us every second and for the power of your Holy Spirit that is available just as readily. Embolden us, empower us to access that power of the Holy Spirit to join you in the work of the world in the name of Jesus as we see where you need us the most to speak your words of comfort and hope, of life and resurrection. Guide us in every step by the power of the Spirit. Amen. <laughs>